Welcome, we're really happy to be here. Today we're going to be discussing the electronic health record, covering its pros and cons, and introducing us all to the concept of the eye patient. My name is Priyanka Agarwal. And I'm Alvin Rajkumar. Let's get started. So um, to cover a bit about what we'll be speaking about today, uh, we want to cover who we are and how we um, came to our positions. We'll cover some basics of the electronic health record, including the history, its pros, cons, and um, pitfalls. And then we'll end with the concept of the eye patient and how to make sure that we really focus on the real patient. We have a few objectives for you. The first is to understand what a modern EHR is and what its goals are. Two, to describe the components of a comprehensive electronic health record. Three, outline the pace of adoption of the EHR and the forces behind the adoption. Four, critically analyze the benefits and risks of the EHR. Uh, and five, anticipate possible patient care advances made possible by the EHR. So first, we wanted to start off by telling you a bit about us and, and how we came to these positions. So um, we both practice in the division of hospital medicine and care for the hospitalized patient. I um, spend a lot of time in technology, and we both do, and really became interested in this idea of how can we use technology to improve patient care and improve clinical outcomes. And so I spend a lot of my time thinking about how can we bring in new technologies into the hospitalized setting, and how can we study their use. As part of this work, I work for the Center for Digital Health Innovation, a group on campus thinking about technology and its use, and focus a lot on putting together partnerships between outside groups in UCSF. I also love seeing patients here at Parnassus and also at Mission Bay Hospital, but I also run a lab that focuses on machine learning and artificial intelligence and how to use the massive data sets we're collecting day in and day out taking care of patients to find ways to improve that patient care delivery and patient safety efforts. So we wanted to start by playing a short video from Dr. Abraham Varghese, who's a master clinician at Stanford. And he really brings home this idea of the challenges of the electronic health record and how can we really make sure that with all of the technology that's available to us, how we really focus on the patient. So we'll stop here for a moment. The previous prototypical example of a patient-doctor relationship is shown in this famous painting uh, by Tate, uh, and it emphasizes the connection between the doctor and the patient. But if you think about modern practice, this relationship has been slightly uh, morphed by the presence of a computer. And, and I think we all want to make sure that with all, all of the tools available to us, that the focus really stay on the patient. And so that's what a lot of our focus is going to be on, both in today's lecture and in the subsequent small group sessions. These doctors are probably looking at the electronic health record. Let's focus about what they did before they had those computers in front of them. So I think we all have in our minds that before the computer, there were paper charts. And I don't know if any of you have had any experience with paper charts, either as a patient or as a provider. Um, Alvin can share a bit about his experience using paper charts um, not too long ago. Yeah, Priyanka, when I was an intern at the San Francisco General Hospital back when it was called that, we had paper notes uh, and paper orders, and so if you wanted to prescribe a laxative for a patient, you'd have to run up to the flight of stairs to the floor, find the paper chart somewhere in the nursing station, write the order, and it would get faxed out down to the pharmacy who then enacted for you. Uh, and so what you're seeing on the screen here is actually reflective of my recent clinical practice. And though we look down on paper records quite a bit, there were definite upsides to it. The first is that it was relatively easy to find what you needed. You may not be able to always read what was there, but you could certainly go back to a date and see when a patient saw a particular provider. And as a physician, writing these records was often pretty brief and would just take a few minutes per chart. Whereas now with the electronic health record, certainly our burdens have gone up with the amount of documentation that both physicians and other providers are having to do. And even when you had to write the orders in the chart, you'd actually had to show it to the nurse. And so I got to know a lot of the nurses uh, just by the very fact of having to write things down and so they could read my order. So now when we think about the electronic health record, one point that we really want to emphasize is that it's so much more than those paper charts simply moved to the computer. 
And so we're going to now go through the components of the modern electronic health record. And I think when we think about the complexity of the modern EHR, the fact that it is so complex has been both a real benefit, but also a challenge. Priyanka, can I ask you a question? What's the difference between an EHR and an EMR? Well, this is something that comes up um, quite a bit. And one thing that we always say is that we are working with an electronic health record and not an electronic medical record. And that is a subtle difference, but one thing that's important to note. Um, with the EHR, we're really thinking comprehensively about the entire health record, not just the paper chart, which was the medical record. We're thinking about a patient's health insurance. We're thinking about labs that may be from the outside. So it's much more than that single chart from a single medical institution. It's really comprehensive around a patient's entire health. So you don't use the term EMR? I like to avoid it. Me too. As we start to think about the current electronic health records and what components are part of their capabilities, we thought it'd be a great exercise to think about, well, if we were building an electronic health record on our own, what sorts of things would we want to include and what sorts of things may we not want to include? And we'd like you to think broadly about this. If you think about the services and apps that you use in your daily life now, like Amazon or Netflix, you're used to getting recommendations of things you should see or triaging articles you'd like to read versus articles you wouldn't want to read. Pause this video now and spend 30 seconds reflecting on what you think an EHR should be able to do in modern times. Priyanka, we've asked this question to previous uh, years of this class. What are some answers we've heard in the past? I think everyone has done an excellent job of covering the basics around documentations. So we want to get not only clinic visits, but medications, lab results, imaging. We want to get other things around some basic clinical decision support. So if a patient has abnormal kidney function, we might need a different dose of a medication. And we want to be able to share basic information across different health institutions so that if I see a patient from Kaiser, I can see what their physicians at Kaiser were doing. Some of the really interesting answers you got were a little more forward-looking. I remember one student, for example, said, if you prescribe a medication, like an opiate medication, whose major side effect is constipation, shouldn't the electronic health record just auto-suggest that you may want to prescribe a laxative alongside it? Or if it actually saw an x-ray with an abnormal finding, couldn't computer vision algorithms actually automatically detect those abnormalities and alert the physician that something had to be done immediately? And by and large, most electronic health records have real challenges in making those recommendations or suggestions. And that's where we see a lot of innovation coming in the next few years. And I think it's going to be a really exciting time for within medicine. Well, why don't we take a step back and show what modern electronic health records actually do in real life? So there are a few categories of information, and this is a study that Ashish Cha did in uh, 2009 in the New England Journal looking at, well, what really makes an electronic health record? And so there are a few categories. So the first big one in red is clinical documentation. And the point to make here is that it's not just clinical visits, but it's also things like problem lists that covers, well, what health problems does a patient have? Medication lists, nursing assessments, and then we move on to test and imaging results. And again, this is not just labs, but radiology images, pathology. And so it's a real breadth of information. And the last two are computer provider order entry, which is replaces the previous practices of having to go to the nursing station, write orders, and just put it into the computer while you're sitting in front of it. Uh, and the last is decision support, or the idea that the computer has some understanding of what's going on with your patients and helps you make decision, for example, if you're trying to order antibiotics for a patient with pneumonia, it might suggest that here are the guideline concordant recommendations for those, of those antibiotics. And you could read the particular list below. And the percentages which are less important here, um, the idea behind them is that really very few hospitals are using health records that can do all of these functionalities comprehensively. And so what we get to is really that in terms of a comprehensive electronic health record, which includes components from all of these categories, there's really a relatively few hospitals that are able to do so, which I found surprising given um, the modern era that we're in. 
we're lucky at UCSF that the electronic health records we use for the majority of care we deliver uh, has all of these features in it. Why don't we take a step back and look at the rate of adoption of electronic health records in this country? It's encouraging that about 80% of hospitals today have some sort of an EHR in use. And even in the hospitals that do have uh, EHRs, again, a minority actually have a comprehensive EHR, uh, and quite a few have this just basic functionality. Why don't we talk about what functionality is missing in the basic versus the comprehensive EHRs? So this is the same health affairs study that was looking at in hospitals who have a basic electronic health record, well, what is really missing? And this is a little bit confusing. So the way that we read this um, is that in hospitals that have only a basic EHR, actually about 60% of them are missing physician notes. About 40% of them are missing diagnostic test results. And so I think that really hones in this fact that imagine if all we had was an electronic health record where you could see, well, the patient demographics and maybe their medicines, but you couldn't see any physician notes, you couldn't see any test results. Then even though your hospital has a health record that's electronic, you're very limited in the amount of information that you can actually access. And a full one-third of hospitals in the U.S. right now are using a basic electronic health record or something less. So while that may seem less relevant to us here in San Francisco, keep in mind that many of our patients who we care for, they're coming to UCSF from outside facilities. And so the records that we get may actually be quite limited. So who actually has a comprehensive EHR? There's a more recent study uh, done in around 2015 that looks at the types of hospitals that are able to adopt a comprehensive EHR versus that, those that aren't. We looked here that in general, about as we talked, about a third of hospitals have a comprehensive EHR, and they tend to be, again, large academic teaching hospitals in urban areas. Hospitals that tend to have less than basic EHR functionality tend to be in rural areas and tend to be safety net hospitals or critical access status of yes. And I think this is an important part to emphasize as we think about health disparities and the types of records that we're getting, um, which is that as providers here at UCSF, we often have to go the extra mile to really get a complete picture of patients who might be coming from either safety net hospitals or from rural areas. And that's something that we just have to be cognizant of as providers. I think that's a great point. So we want to go back to thinking about the electronic health record adoption and thinking about, well, what really spurred this increase in the rate of adoption around 2010? And one point that we wanted to make that you all know growing up in this era, which is that healthcare is relatively late to the electronic health record adoption and to technology in general, thinking about Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, and other technologies that we use day in and day out that actually started um, a lot before electronic health records really started to be adopted. So one of the critical questions, Franca, is why is this slope so low? Yeah, so let's think a little bit now about the barriers of adopting electronic health record. I think cost is certainly one of them. And not only are electronic health records incredibly expensive to adopt, and I think this is a good point to pause and just reflect, stop here and think about, well, how much do you think it really costs a health system to adopt an electronic health record? Do you think it's single millions of dollars, tens of millions, or hundreds of millions? Well, Priyanka, right before this lecture, we were lucky to talk to the chief uh, medical information officer at UCSF, uh, and I learned that it's on the order of magnitudes of hundreds of millions of dollars to adopt an electronic health record. And every year, the budget to run an EHR is an order of tens to even hundreds of millions of dollars. This is a big deal. And I think that's, again, why so many hospitals don't have comprehensive electronic health record. Thinking about the economics, it's important to emphasize not only is just the absolute cost of these systems incredibly expensive, but also in terms of the health system, the incentives are often not aligned. So the benefits of electronic health records, which we'll get to, really can be around coordination of care and preventative services. And in a fee-for-service environment, it can be really challenging to make those investments when we get paid more oftentimes as a patient accesses more care. But the good news is, is that as we transition away from strict fee-for-service and move into value-based care and accountable care organizations, the incentives do start to align better. 
But I'll mention that largely the absolute cost is high and the way that we're reimbursed can be challenging in terms of making those investments. And the cost is accrued in multiple ways. One, it's logistically hard to implement an electronic health record, uh, culturally to go from a paper record to actually using the computer. Uh, technically, it's very difficult to get the systems to work together with existing infrastructure, uh, and very difficult to have information exchange from one health system to another, uh, this difficult information exchange. Um, one, one point that I also want to make is that it requires huge not only technology investments, um, and, Al and Alvin hinted at this, but culturally it's a, it's a big change for providers as well. When UCSF went through this transition a few years prior, we literally had to train every single provider who touches the electronic health record. And it's a huge not only cost, but also just coordination in terms of how do we make sure that everybody who uses this new tool and technology is well trained in it. And there are big implications if there are any privacy breaches in an electronic health system. Uh, it's very costly to pay for those types of issues. So what's the major event that spurred that inflection point around 2010? Turned out it was an economic crisis, that when the country was in a major recession, uh, the government wanted to find a way to put money back into the system, and they were looking for shovel-ready projects. Uh, and it was decided that healthcare was shovel ready to adopt EHRs. Uh, we think that would help with, which they thought would help with patient safety uh, and patient care advances. And certainly the act was successful in that if you look at the rate of adoption, going back to that prior slide, it certainly picked up exponentially. And we are now at a point where 80% of hospitals are using electronic health records, which is exactly what the act was trying to achieve. Overall, they used over $29 billion over 10 years uh, via what was called the High Tech Act, or the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. So, you know, now put yourself in the government's shoes, and I think it'd be a good thought exercise to just pause here for 30 seconds and think about how would you make sure that the money is used wisely? What sorts of rules and regulations would you want to put in place? Would you just want to give hospitals money and say, here's a few million dollars, go and buy your favorite electronic health record? Or, or would you want to make sure that really certain criteria were being met? And so that's exactly what the government did. They put rules behind the money. And they said that, well, not only do you have to adopt an EHR, which is, of course, the first goal, you had to make sure that the electronic health records that you were using would be able to exchange information with other um, with other health systems. And we also wanted to make sure that not only were you documenting within the electronic health record, but that there were additional functionalities behind documentation, ideas around clinical decision support, computerized order entry, enabling patients to access their own information. And so what we ended up with was a set of what the government calls meaningful use criteria. How did the government make sure the money was used wisely? Well, it created a set of criteria called meaningful use. Before I show you the next part of the slide, please don't memorize this. It's meant just for your information. So the government created three stages of criteria. The first one focused on data capture and included concepts like making sure that EHRs electronically captured health information in a standardized format, that information uh, could be used to track key clinical conditions, uh, and you could promote communication uh, for care coordination of patients. The second stage focused more on data sharing and really allowed for more rigorous health information exchanged uh, and had increasing requirements for e-prescribing and incorporating lab results into the EHR. And the third area really focuses on improving clinical outcomes. So it's things like making sure that patients can access self-management tools so that they can manage their own chronic illness. Ideas around, well, how can we improve health on a population level? How can a physician look at their whole panel for patients and not just their individual patients? And so the idea behind this was that we wouldn't expect hospitals to be able to achieve all of these functionalities all at once, but that over time they would be able to, and that with every stage there would be economic incentives. And as you can imagine, these criteria were somewhat controversial, and they continue to be. So this is an area that may continue to change over time. But I think nobody can criticize the government for saying that some conditions needed to be met, and there's going to be continuing dialogue around, well, what should be included and what shouldn't be to achieve meaningful use.
So we do think it's important to spend just a minute talking about health information exchange. And I highlight this only because it is such a challenging part of using electronic health records um, at present. So the first point, and this this very simple graphic just illustrates that when we think about health information exchange, it's not only from hospital to hospital or hospital to provider, it's including just the whole breadth of the ecosystem, which includes payers, the government, pharmacies, labs like Quest. Um, and so it's a, it's a pretty complex interplay between information amongst pretty disparate groups. The other point to mention um, as we move beyond the electronic health record, which is that over time, um, and this graphic doesn't capture that, it's not only information between the health record and these other facilities, it's going to be amongst other technological tools, whether it's apps on your iPhone or um, other connected medical devices. And this is really an area that has been incredibly challenging and has um, frankly hindered a lot of uh, innovation in the healthcare system since this exchange is so challenging. And so right now at UCSF, for example, it is possible for us to view information from outside labs, from other healthcare facilities. And we do have some healthcare applications that can interface with our electronic health record. But this can often be a very tedious process and is an area that we hope to see evolve over time. Thanks. So to give you a brief overview of the most commonly used electronic health records, here is a simple illustrative graph uh, which shows the major players. Uh, UCSF largely uses EPIC. Uh, There's also all scripts and eClinical works. Uh, But notice there's this large gray area here just full of various other vendors. We think this is going to continue to evolve over time, but you should have a basic sense of the major players. Why don't we focus on some of the benefits of the electronic health record? Here's a study that looked at whether the EHR promoted certain features of care, like on the bottom, efficiency of care or provider satisfaction. Interestingly, uh, there are many studies that show that the electronic health record can improve the efficiency of care. For example, one example from my own clinical practice is uh, last week, we admitted a a woman for whom we wanted to know her heart function status. And she had no records in our system, but we were able to actually peer into the electronic health records at a neighboring health system where she had been seen previously and found the results of tests that so we didn't have to order them again. And so I would count that as a win for efficiency of care by using the electronic health record. Let me talk briefly about the issue of provider satisfaction. Many studies show either a positive or mixed positive effect of electronic health, electronic health records in improving provider satisfaction. For example, uh, things that clearly are better in my personal experience, that if you want to order a medication, using uh, an electronic order entry system is far superior uh, to having to go to a patient's chart and write the orders down. However, some things are made more complicated. For example, even ordering a simple blood transfusion used to be one line of writing, but now there's a complicated order set that has to be filled out precisely. uh, And it's kind of confusing of what you're supposed to enter and what you're supposed to leave blank uh, in part of this electronic form. So I'd say in general, that's been my experience and talking to other doctors across the country that in general, I would say people are dissatisfied with some of the user interfaces they're presented with. Uh, and provide kind of mixed reports about whether the EHR really makes them more satisfied with their work or less satisfied, although this study seems to suggest more satisfied. It is interesting to note that there are a few areas in which it's not that well studied how electronic health records are affecting outcomes. And that's specifically if we look at issues like, are electronic health records improving preventive care? and access to care. And I think this is really because electronic health records are very good at the documentation piece, but as we get to more sophisticated clinical decision support and coordination of care, there's still a lot of strides that need to be made. Really, the ultimate goal of the electronic health record is to improve clinical outcomes and clinical care. And it is interesting to look at, well, what clinical evidence is there that health systems who adopt electronic health records actually have better clinical outcomes? So this data is a bit confusing, but I, I want to summarize it. And this was a study that looked at 27,000 patients across many different practices who had diabetes and compared the care at practices that had electronic health record versus that those that only had paper records. And there were two types of care that was looked at. 
One was just composite care. And so these are really process outcomes. Did providers check hemoglobin A1Cs? Did they provide foot exams to patients? Things were tasks that were need, needed to be done. And then the other set of um, information that was looked at was, was really clinical care. So were patients healthier? Did they have better controlled diabetes? And what they found was that practices who had electronic health records were much better at meeting process outcomes. So there were, they did actually 35% better than practices that only had paper charts. And this was due in large part to reminders that the electronic health record could provide and just highlighting when certain care outcomes hadn't been done. So, oh, this patient hasn't had a foot exam. Remember to do that. Or when a patient, uh, when a provider does chart review, they could see, oh, this patient needs to have this certain lab checked. All of that is easier with the electronic health record. Now, practices that had electronic health records did do about 15 percentage points better in uh, overall clinical care and clinical outcomes, but that difference is not as huge as it was in the process outcomes. So. A lot more research needs to be done in this area, but it seems that electronic health records are really good at making sure that care is provided, but that there could be more to be done in terms of making sure that actually patients are actually doing better. And so that can sometimes be the criticism that electronic health records receive. Those were some of the benefits in the electronic health record. Now let's talk about a few of the key challenges. Here are five that we've identified. Usability, chart lore, physicians as transcriptionists, lack of interoperability, and, of course, the eye patient. Usability. If you are used to using something like the iPhone or Android, you're ex used to actually dealing with fairly nice user interfaces. In general, electronic health records don't have such great interfaces. Here's a study that actually looked at how lab results are presented to physicians in an EHR, and you can see the multiple areas of deficiencies identified by this study. In general, this is a major issue, but I think electronic health record companies are continuing to make progress in this area, and hopefully by the time you're an attending physician, this will have been improved. So chart lore is another big one, and we have a picture here which is meant to simulate a, a game of telephone. But the idea is, is that once you write something in the chart, it tends to get copy forwarded. So if you include in the problem list that a patient had a pulmonary embolus, that will tend to be included in note after note after note. And it really takes a very dedicated and good clinician to stop and ask, wait, what evidence do we really have that the patient did have a pulmonary embolus? And so that's something that as providers, we need to be very thoughtful. It's very easy to write something in the chart. This is a difficult patient. This patient had a pulmonary embolism in the past or whatever it may be that we're writing. But keep in mind that Whatever we write is very, very powerful. And so not only as we write in a chart, but also as we read charts, we need to keep in mind that what's there is most likely true, but it's ultimately our responsibility to confirm it for the sake of the patient. And I think that's an area that I see some students having problems with once they enter the clinical wards, is that they'll find something in the chart and assume it's true without going back to verifying that this patient truly does have a diagnosis of dementia. Or if they didn't, where did this come from and why is it in the patient's chart? Here's a major problem where I personally feel the electronic health record uh, could be improved uh, in a major way, that there is a lot of talk that the physicians are now becoming just really uh, well-paid transcriptionists or data entry monkeys. Uh, and there's, here's a fantastic article recently in the New England Journal of Medicine which describes this disruption of the physician's work. And what used to be our personal way to convey information to other physicians or to record information for our own clinical decision making, the clinical note, has been transformed into this multi-purpose document that's used for billing, documentation, for quality improvement. Uh, and that's changed the nature of our notes and fundamentally our work. Uh, and so this is an area that we're going to continue to see uh, evolutions on. Uh, that notes, for example, will become open notes where patients can fully view the note and even edit, edit themselves. Uh, and to, as a some reaction to this, now some physicians hire scribes or people to actually write the notes for them because it's so laborious. I don't know, Priyanka, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, you know, I think there are definite challenges as the burden and volume of our note writing grows, but 
I still feel like it's incredibly important. And I find that I often think differently about patients once I'm actually forced to sit down and write the notes. So I think there are challenges with note writing, but I still view it as an incredibly important part of what we do. And I, I try to take a more, more positive outlook. That's Priyanka for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so, you know, this is um, a theme that we touched on a bit earlier, which is the lack of interoperability. And so um, this is a kind of joke back to that old commercial about the are you an IBM or are you an Apple? Well, students get this these days. I, I, I think so. <laughs> um, but this is really that idea of it can be so hard for other tools to interface with our current electronic health records. And so things that seem like should be so easy, like getting information from a patient's home blood pressure cuff is actually pretty laborious. And um, suffice to say, this is an area of really active work. And our hope is that in coming years, the electronic health record is not going to be so central to what we do, but it's just going to be one of many tools that we're using as providers, and hopefully in a way that isn't burdensome and is actually enriching for um, ultimately our care of patients. And finally, we get to the eye patient. That we're not going to belabor the point, and uh, we hope that you'll watch the video that we showed a clip of earlier. But there's this concept that we get really used to treating the computer rather than the patient in front of us. Uh, and for example, last week there was an emergency uh, in one of the patient's rooms, and there's a tendency to quickly go to the computer and say, well, what were the previous lab tests uh, that were obtained in this patient, or what were the previous uh, imaging results? when oftentimes the most important thing is actually examining the patient in front of you. Uh, it's been said that the easiest way and most current way to diagnose an amputee is to actually see the x-ray without the limb rather than just look at the patient. And this is something that we would like you to be really cognizant of as you enter the clinical arena, that there is this connection between who the patient is and how they're represented in the EHR. And it's important to keep an eye on both, but fundamentally all of this work we're doing in terms of education, research is to help the patient and not just the eye patient. Absolutely. And and again, I think we always want to be optimistic and um, the electronic health record, I think ultimately has done huge amounts for safety, costs, and I think is going to continue to improve. But we always want to realize and something that we really wanted to emphasize today um, that Give, despite how rich it is and how helpful it's been, we always, of course, want to keep our focus on the patient. And I think you all are going to be so well trained in this because you're going to be doing this really from day one. And so ultimately, we'll be learning from you um, to really how best to interface both um, with the different technologies that we're going to see and also with a patient. So um, I think it's going to be um, a challenge, but also really exciting and, and I think really important. Absolutely. If you want to learn more about any of the topics we've talked about today or explore further the implications of the digitization of medicine, we'd encourage you to think about getting this book called The Digital Doctor. It's written by the chair of medicine here at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, this also happens to be my boss. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Uh, we'd encourage you to check it out. So we want to do one last thought assignment with you all, which is to really take note of how different providers you've seen have interfaced with the electronic health record. Some of those may be positive and some of those may be negative. We want you to really reflect further on how you can best use the EHR, develop your own style, and really harness all those positives without falling into some of the challenges that some providers can face. And we're really going to cover this further in the upcoming small groups. And so as you continue to have more clinical encounters, we want you to keep noticing how different providers use the electronic health record and really adapt the positive things that you see in your own practice. We do want to end um, just in a, on a forward-thinking note, which is that we wanted to share with you some of the things that we think are coming next beyond the electronic health record as we all get closer to our goal of providing better and better clinical care. And um, we always want to keep this centered on patients. And one piece that I'm just really, really excited about is thinking about how these modern tools can really re-envision really what is healthcare and how patients are engaging with their health. I really think that the amount that patients are going to be able to do is just going to grow and grow. And we're going to see realities like thinking about how can we provide more and more hospital care at home even. 
And I think it's just a really um, exciting time. And both Alvin and I are happy to provide any mentoring for anybody who wants to delve into these issues further. Yeah, I agree with everything you said that for me, what's really exciting is that we're generating data about our patients every single day as part of routine care. And if we want to do studies uh, that require large data sets, well, now is the time to do it uh, and to start thinking about how can we provide care in ways that we couldn't in the past because the data wasn't available. So for example, some of the studies that we're working on in my lab are identifying patients who are at risk for having to go to the emergency room or going to the intensive care unit as far in advance as we can, and not using just traditional markers, but using natural language processing to identify exactly what's been said about the patient to give us a better prediction about what's going to happen. Uh, we also use computer vision algorithms to help, under, help have the computer do initial processing of what's actually in an image that has to be dealt with clinically right now. Uh, and can we harness that data and provide information for doctors and nurses and pharmacists to provide better care? So I think there are a lot of really exciting opportunities that are going to be coming up. Uh, I would encourage you to be part of it. Thank you all again. Thank you.